afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are tuning in from around the world. Welcome to the first IHF Live online symposium. My name is Courtney Gay and I'm a member of the IHF Media Group and I'm the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I will outline the translation options that we have available. We have French, Spanish and Arabic. To use one of the translation options, simply click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen, marked interpretation and choose your language. Please remember to mute the original audio when you're using this function. And please note also that Arabic is available under the label Chinese. This first IHF live online symposium forms part of the virtual academy recently launched by the IHF to allow for global education opportunities online as well as online licensing. All of this falls under the umbrella of the IHF Education Centre at ihfeducation.ihf.info. This first IHF live online symposium encompasses a total of 20 lectures presented by top handball experts from around the world. This afternoon's lecture is presented by Mats Olsen, member of the IHF Commission for Coaching and Methods, a former top player himself and now coach, goalkeeping coach, working with top national teams and club teams. Very influential in today's game. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture and we will do our best to address as many of them as possible. Also note that this lecture is being recorded and you will be able to access it for on-demand viewing later on the IHF Education Centre. And with that, Mats, we are ready for you to begin. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the, for the introduction. And I say the same, uh, good morning, good night, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, all over the world. Uh, I've been doing some kind, some uh, kinds of uh, webinars now, uh, but I've never done one worldwide at the same time. It's always been to one part of the world. So this will be very interesting today to do something new, even for me, to, to talk uh, to the whole planet Earth at the same time. I think it's the first time in my, in my life. So it's uh, a little bit exciting also for me. Um, like uh, Courtney said, today we're going to speak a little bit extra about the goalkeepers. Uh, that is a little bit of my... Uh, speciality uh, part of the, the the global handball game so uh, we should go on and uh, work a little bit more uh, with the goalkeepers today so i should start it up from the beginning and uh, share my uh, video screen with you everybody so we can go on directly where we should be we should be up there and uh, now we should start i think is there so that everybody can see this presentation? I can hope now. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> a, little, a small introduction about myself. Uh, even Courtney has uh, said a bit, I'm a member of the CCM, uh, the Commission of Method and uh, Training Commission. And I'm also working uh, today in the Norwegian Humboldt Federation, especially, and where I work with uh, the women team. And I'm also involved with the men's team in the Swedish handball national, uh, national team. So uh, for this season, 2019-20, uh, I was working especially with these six goalkeepers that we can look, look here at this uh, photo. No? This is uh, Andrea Ausmo Pedersen from Norway, Silja Solberg, uh, Emily Stang Sande from Norway. We had Andreas Palika. I'm uh, Mikael Appelgren and Tobias Tolin from Sweden. These are the goalkeepers that have been working close to this last season. And my job, as I said, is uh, normally to work with these goalkeepers and also in the function in the Norwegian Federation is I'm also working with the education no? and they try to try to develop uh, handball and try to develop the education form. So, but today we will uh, start it up and uh, talk about the, the basic concepts in a different way about goalkeeper coach education. So I hope <clears throat> you will enjoy the, the ride uh, all the way to the finish and I hope uh, you will enjoy it also, all the way. So we have one of the biggest uh, goalkeepers in the world who finished his career now uh, during, uh, during the Korea, uh, Corina, or Corina or Corona crisis. And uh, he said this in, in, a, in a paper interview in the Spanish paper, Arpad Sterbik, who was a legend, uh, expert in goalkeeping and uh, very, very good. Uh, one of the best we ever had in the goalkeeping. 
And uh, as he is saying in this uh, interview, he's saying, and if you see how the back players are throwing now at 100 kilometers per hour, it is very difficult to react on the, one of those shots. You must be a mentalist. You, to be a goalkeeper is more of a head than anything else. There are people faster than me with a better reaction and more athletic body, but the head tells you where it goes, to which side at what moment. And this is <clears throat> very, very good uh, spoken by uh, Arpad because this is what goalkeeping is going about. Goalkeeping is not going about uh, to be the technical uh, advocate uh, way of playing. Because uh, what I want to show you I, and I want you to think about is the most important thing, even for the goalkeeper, is to be uh, ready on the brain. Here he is talking about, talking about that uh, a lot of shooters today are shooting about 120 kilometers per hour. I think I remember that in the last European Championships in uh, January in, uh, in Sweden and uh, Norway and uh, Austria, uh, it was, uh, I think the hardest shot was uh, 139 kilometers per hour. That was the hardest one. So almost the normal shot at the top level, it's uh, 120 kilometers per hour. And as he is saying, it's impossible for a goalkeeper to just be uh, reacting on the ball. We have to be uh, aware, uh, try to be a little bit uh, knowing what's going to happen to try to stop the ball. Because as we know, everybody knows it, that um, the goalkeeper, mm, people can talk about the person, of the importance of a goalkeeper in the game. I don't want to talk about the person, but we all know that if you want to do something high level in whatever competition, you need a goalkeeper that is in a high level also. And goalkeeping today is not only to, be, to stop the ball. I say, <clears throat> you can never say how much importance it has, but we all know that the, the goalkeeper, uh, is the last one to touch the ball and the first one to touch the ball. So we are always in the mo mode to be the most important person in the game because we are able to stop the shot and we are the first man to start the new attack for our team. So if we don't have a goalkeeper that is good in either one of the positions to stop the ball or start the game, we have problems. So we have to prepare the goalkeepers to be in the both situation in the best way. <clears throat> uh, so if we look at this, we just see a picture of a ball. And if we just have a picture of a ball, we don't know anything. The ball is not saying you anything. It just says it's there. We, in this photo, we, it's, uh, you don't know if it, in which direction it goes either. But if we put in a body, if we do this, then we can start to think about it. If I'm a goalkeeper, on that photo with uh, just the ball, I want to see, there is the ball. <clears throat> with this, if I'm a goalkeeper and I'm looking at this ball, I don't know anything. If I fix too much the ball, I don't know where the ball is coming into the goal. But if I put in this player, then I can start to read. Then it's giving me information. Now I look, I can see that he's looking at me, even if he's not, he's just in a, in a shadow way. No? But he's giving my, me some information. I can look at him, I can see, at his, look at his hand, I can look at his elbow, I can look at his shoulder, I can look at his left hand, and I can look at his hips, and I can look at his eyes. All this gives me, as a goalkeeper, a lot of information, what this player is thinking to do. But if I just look at the ball and I'm just playing against the ball, then I don't have any possibilities or very small possibilities to stop the ball. So we have to learn, <clears throat> we have to teach the goalkeepers that they have to be able to more look at the players, to read the game, to read the shoot, read the shot where it's going to come in the game. So my, bay, my way of uh, thinking about this is that um, when we are young, it's very important that we don't start too early to learn the goalkeeper's techniques. Because if we start in these ages when we are very young, I will talk about a little bit more about a little bit later on in this presentation, we miss a big thing. Because now in these ages, when you can see the guys are 10, 11, 12 years old on this photo, uh, it's important for the goalkeeper just to learn to read a little bit about the body language of the shooter, no? 
by yourself. If we try to say, to, to choose to, to tell this goalkeeper how he should be standing, how he should be acting, then he is missing the most important thing in his education, his education of himself, when he's starting to read the body language of the shooter. Here he has a lot of experience when you're playing as a goalkeeper when you're young. So it's very important that we don't start too early with the, the techniques training for the goalkeepers. Because if we do that, this will happen. We will have goalkeepers that is just thinking about themselves and thinking about the technique they should use and try to do the same as big as possible in the moment when the, the ball is coming to you uh, in, a, in a shot. And it's not acting against the ball or against the shooter. It's a big difference between this kind of goalkeeper. I put him in the shadow because I don't want anyone to see who it is. Because this is not a good way of goalkeeping. This is a way of trying to be as big as possible in the moment of the shot and try to be lucky. Because if this goalkeeper is going to save this ball, it's because of the shooter. It's not shooting good. Because if the shooter is looking at the goalkeeper, then he can put the ball wherever he wants. What the goalkeeper had to learn is this. This is what we have to learn from the beginning. To read the body language of the shooter. Here we can see uh, Alilovic, uh, operation goalkeeper, on this photo, is making a very good save. I'm quite sure it will be a save. Or, uh, I don't know, but I know. And I know the result because I've not seen the, the video, but I know by the photo that this will be a save. This will not be a goal because he is acting exactly as he should do. He's going against the player, the way the player is going, he's going against the ball, he's looking at the arm, he's looking at the fingers, and he's doing everything correctly because of the ball is not going inside the net. So it's a big difference between this action and this action. This action is just try to hit me the ball. If I'm lucky, I have a good day. And this is a good action from the goalkeeper because he's going through the ball, against the ball, and he wants to save the ball. And that is uh, one thing that we have to try to learn the goalkeeper from the beginning. The ball is the most important thing. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at this uh, photo, or these four different photos, I want to try to explain a little bit what it is to be a goalkeeper. If you look at the photo up here to the left, we can see a player uh, with a ball from long distance, from a long distance shot. And this is um, uh, a situation that is give the goalkeeper a lot of information, a lot of information we have to make into our brain and into our computer in the brain to take the right decision. <clears throat> First of all, we have the player, the Slovenian player who is jumping and he wants to shoot. And I, as a goalkeeper in this moment, I have to start to look at the player. And uh, because before that, uh, there have been, uh, like I will also play, explain a little bit later, there have been some kind of action from the team, from the Slovenian team, because the, to put this player into the situation. But in this moment, I, as a goalkeeper, need to look at the player. I need to look at his eyes, his shoulder, his elbow, his hand and every information I can get out of him. But in the same time, I also have to look at my defender because he is also giving me information. So here is double information. I need the information from the shooter and the information from my own defender. And after that, I can take the decision to know where I should go, where the ball is coming into the net. No? So this is a situation that it's uh, quite rough for the goalkeeper. A lot of things that we have to look at and a lot of things to be uh, taking decision about. The next uh, photo down down here to the left, it's uh, Aron Palmarsson, Icelandic player who plays in Barcelona. And he is an mm, incredible hard shooter with a little bit, uh, with a little bit, uh, gives the goalkeeper little information uh, about what he's going to do. Because he's using a lot of the the arm and the elbow. He's not using the shoulder so much, but he is easily putting up the ball in 120 kilometers. So he is the representation of all the shooters from the backcourt that can shoot 
over 120 kilometers per hour, like Artan Sterbik said. He's one good example of these players that we goalkeepers has to be prepared to stop the ball from. Up to the right, we have a Norwegian young player, Alexander Blongs, who is also playing now in the national team. He's a wing player. And when you look at the wing players, you can see the development of the wing players today. And uh, if we look at the, his way of holding the ball, comparing with the back players who is going to shoot a hard shot and comparing with the wing players, the information for the goalkeeper is totally different. Here, from this arm and these fingers and everything, all the techniques this player can use to shoot uh, the ball against you in the, in the game, it's very complicated for us uh, goalkeepers to try to read out, to find out where he's really thinking to do about this. So this is one of the situations that is very, very complicated for the goalkeepers against uh, the, the wing players. Today also, uh, with the development of the game, we can also say that the, the wings are a little bit of the kings or queens, if you're talking about women handball. Uh, I, in this way, because uh, we have developed the handball in a way that we are saying that uh, we don't want the, the game to be too rough. And when a wing player is jumping in to shoot, he is today uh, a, a person that, that's untouchable. If he is touched, he will have the seven meter throw and it can also be a two meter, a two minutes suspension. No? That makes that the wing player, when he's going in to shoot against the goalkeeper, he can concentrate or she can concentrate at 100% on the goalkeeper and look at the goalkeeper. That has made the position for us as a goalkeepers uh, very complicated to really uh, find out what the wing players are doing. But we are working hard on this to, uh, to get a better development of the goalkeepers on the wings. And the, and the fourth uh, players is Luca Balou. He's down here and he is representing the, the power of the players. Not only in the shooting, like Aaron Palmerson, he was uh, the power of the shooting. And here, uh, Luca Avalo is uh, representing the, the physical strength of the players today, that we should be prepared as a goalkeeper, because he's jumping <clears throat> and he can be keep up in the air for a long time. So we as a goalkeeper has to know uh, when the ball is coming. It's not only to where, know where it's coming, it's also to know when he's going to shoot because uh, we can't go too early. If we go too early, the player see it and they puts the ball on the other side. So this is also putting in a complicated situation for the goalkeeper because we don't know when he's going to shoot. He can shoot when he's up on the top or when he's going down. So this is the, the complicated situation to be a goalkeeper. Players uh, that shoot it from back uh, court that we have to be collaborating with the uh, defenders, hard shooters that is very uh, technical uh, players also from the back court, and the wing players and the pivot players that is uh, today uh, an extremely technique to, to uh, shoot in these ways, and also the physical preparation of all the handball players today is even better than it was in my time when I was playing. So this is the situation for us, the goalkeepers in the future. That is what we have to prepare the goalkeepers for these kind of situations. So let's see. This is one thing that has not changed for all time in Hamburg. Uh, this is a goal. This is uh, six square meters, three meters for two meters, and it's six square meters. This is what we have to use for the goalkeeper. But the goalkeepers, I like to show you some photos that they give you a little bit of information that you should use your in imagination also, no? But what kind of goalkeepers do we want to create? How do we want to develop the goalkeepers? There are two ways. One way is this. And what do I want to say with this? This is one way that we want to make everybody, every goalkeepers in the same way. Uh, there we have a, a, a bouquet of roses, red roses, nice. Uh, sometimes I give this to my wife when she's having a birthday or something. She will have a, a, a bouquet of red roses as a present. But this is not so good for the goalkeepers. And this is what a lot of time what's happening in the goalkeeper coach education. We put everybody in the same way. As we can see, the smallest rose is maybe a goalkeeper that is 175 and the highest rose is a goalkeeper that is 
two meters. And we are putting them to play, to fit into the goalkeeper uh, education, to play one similar way. I don't think that's the right way because I want to play, prefer this one, this summer bouquet of flowers with a different of flowers because we have to accept that the, the, the small goalkeeper or the small flower also has the possibility to develop as a blue one or the big one as a white one or a green one. So the way that we should train, that we should uh, educate the goalkeepers is not to put them in the same way. Because if we put them in the same way, this will happen. And this is sometimes a fault that we are doing. We are looking at someone and we are giving them the instruction of how a goalkeeper should be, how a, goal, a goalkeeper position should be. Um, there is no, in my opinion, no one uh, their own, uh, initial position for a goalkeeper that is the best one. Each goalkeeper has the way to, uh, to act as he or she is feeling as the best way. So when I'm talking about this, this kind of summer bouquet of flowers, that is very nice, we can have this kind of goalkeepers. This is one of my goalkeepers that I'm working with, Andreas Palika. Andreas Palika is a goalkeeper that is uh, not uh, over 190. He's 180 something, uh, but he's very powerful. And he has a, uh, a lot of uh, inspiration, reaction, he's very power, and he's jumping a lot in the goal. So if I wanted to make him one of goalkeepers like this, he will not be able to be in the top of the world. But what we are working with is like this. We try to make him out the best out of his possibilities. So this is the important way of thinking when we are coaching the goalkeepers. There is no one way to be a goalkeeper. There's a lot of ways to be a goalkeeper. So we have to be prepared as goalkeeper coaches or head coaches when we're talking about the goalkeepers, that there is no one way. Even if I say that, uh, of course, we have to be able to take off some, to shorten the stems of the, of the flowers, no? If we take, uh, if everybody uh, should play there are some common things, uh, yes, as a goalkeeper. I don't say that there is some, uh, but it's not that everything should be in the same way. Of course, there should be some things in the goalkeeping that is uh, normal for everybody. That should be what we should be having as a ground to stand on. No? And in that way, in my opinion, there is one important thing that I want to uh, uh, introduction make an introduction to you how I think it's important to start with the goalkeepers is what I call the, the boxing position. Um, I show you two photos here. One of them is the old boxer uh, Mohammed Ali. Uh, maybe in my opinion, I'm not a fan of boxing or uh, whatever the, the, the fightings in, in, uh, in, uh, in the combats. But I have to say that I was a little bit inspired by Muhammad Ali when he was a great boxer in the 60s and the 70s because he had a way of boxing that he was dancing in the floor, on the floor. He was dancing in the ring you know, and he was moving around. And I think that this position as a boxer, I call it the boxer position, is the way that the goalkeepers start as a, when we play, start to play. And, we, and to the right of the photo on this um, PowerPoint presentation, we can see Michael Appelgren, the other goalkeeper I'm working with from the men's team in, uh, in Sweden. He is using this boxer position in his playing, when he's playing as a goalkeeper. And I think this is uh, a way that we should teach, especially the young ones, when they start as a goalkeeper. When you're making, uh, uh, moving around in the goal, when the, the attacking uh, team is starting up their attacking and passing the ball, there is no way for the goalkeeper to make a move around in the goal in a, in a, in a position that is not comfortable for the, for the goalkeeper. It's very important that we, if we want to have good goalkeepers, that the, the, the goalkeeper should be comfortable in his physical position to be in the goal to be uh, able to act when he really has to act. Because if we are not able to, to do the action in a comfort way, 
then we don't have uh, the, um, the speed in our movements that is good enough. So uh, I will show you some examples of goalkeepers from the women's world and from the women's world. I'm very lucky guy. I'm maybe the most lucky guy in the humble world who's working with goalkeepers. Because I have the possibility to work in men's and women's world. And uh, I have a lot of times questions about that. Uh, that people that ask, ask me, but how do you train the women's goalkeeper comparing with the men's goalkeeper? And my question is the same way. I don't make any difference to how to train the women's team or the men's team. We, uh, we are talking the same language. We are talking the same preparation. We are making the same physical preparation. We are making the same tactical uh, preparations. We're making everything the same for the men's and for the women's. Then I'm also aware of that the, uh, what the big difference between the women's and the men's way of playing is that the field players are different. The goal is six, still six square meters for the women's. It's the same size of the goal. But the problem or the, the difference is in the way of shooting. Because the guys are sometimes higher, they are jumping higher, they have a little bit more power, they're staying a little bit more time in the air. So geometrically, we have to be thinking about other, other angles when we're talking about the goalkeeping for the women's than for the men's. Because a, a men's player and a backcourt player maybe is shooting from three meters high. He's two meters high, he's jumping 50 centimeters, and has an arm that is 50 centimeters. Then is the ball is at three meters, so we have to be aware of that. But the women's maybe they're uh, reaching 230 to 40 uh, from the height of the of the players when they're shooting, and the same from the wing position and from the from the pivot position. No? So the only way that I can see that it's the the difference between the women's and the men's is the the geometrical way. Maybe it's also, uh, of course, the, the women's are not shooting un, up today, 140 kilometers per hour. It's a little bit uh, slower the ball. But uh, in that way, it's no difference because their reaction time and everything is the same. No? So the way I'm training the goalkeepers is the same way. I also want to say I put in inside uh, the way when I'm working with a goalkeeper four stages uh, of goalkeeping. Um, the first stage of the goalkeeping is when you're standing in the goal and the attacker is attacking. It's what I call, call the, the move around phase. Uh, the team is making the move arounds and you are just there to be prepared. You're not, uh, you're, the attacking team is really not making until an effort to make a shot. They are preparing their attack. And in that moment, the goalkeeper should not be uh, taking a lot of energy into the position. They have to be just moving around smoothly. And the second uh, stage for the goalkeeper is what I call this, uh, the positioning phase, where the really the attacking uh, team is putting in the player to finalize. And it could be a back player, it could be a wing player, but in that moment, the goalkeeper knows that now it's going to be a shot. So I have to prepare myself for the shot. And that is the positioning phase where the goalkeeper is, the keeper has to be, be in the right position for the shot. No? The third phase is the, is the action, where we really do the action, where we have to be in the right place, in the right moment to act, to react and make, make the save. And after that, it will be the fourth uh, phase. And that phase is the starting. We have to be able to start the attack we are, as I said in the beginning, in, in, in the introduction, at that we as a goalkeepers, we are the last one, we make the save, and we are the first one, we start the attack. So the best goalkeepers are uh, very uh, comfortable in these four phases of the, uh, of the game. Now we should start to look a little bit about the, the goalkeepers. So uh, we go down first to look a little bit uh, videos from the the World Championships in uh, Japan, and I will show you some goalkeepers. Uh, first of all, we have a Serbian goalkeeper, Tomasevic. Uh, experienced goalkeeper, 
uh, it's maybe not the best technical way, not the physical way either, but one of the best brains in the humble world, because she is always acting in the way to be in the right position of the shooting. As you can see in this or different stages or phases, she's acting very calmly and moving around very calmly. And here we now have uh, the Danish goalkeeper, uh, Sandra Toft, that for me was the best uh, goalkeeper the last season in the World Championship and also during the season. She's playing in Brest in France and also in the, uh, she made an impressive uh, World Championships in the Japan, but the, the Danish team was not uh, responding so well as she did. But as you can see, when she's moving around in the goal, and when Norway's here is starting the attack, she's very calmly, she's very acting uh, uh, in her way, try, trying to be in the right position in the right moment. As we can see now, when Norway is starting the attack, she is not giving in any energy at all. She's standing around. There's no coach that told her that you should have the arms up, you should do like this, you should do like this. But now, when she sees the team is starting to make something interesting, she gets into action. And she is very clever, and she is very good to read the shot of the players. And we can also see she is good, very good to make stand in the right position and make the right timing of the movement. No? The third goalkeeper I want to show you is a goalkeeper from Germany, Eckerle. That is one of, uh, she's not the smallest, but she's not so high, but she's very quick and very reaction. She has totally different style if you're looking to her, comparing with the two other goalkeepers, Tomasevic and Tov. You can see that she's working with her arms very high, and she's working also very far away from the goal, out to be close to the shooters when they're getting into the line. No? So she's trying to play with the angles, the geometry in her way of what she thinks is the best way for her. And now we have the, the smallest goalkeeper in the top of the world, Silvia Navarro from Spain. And she's also playing very cleverly, uses a lot of brain. She knows where she is having uh, her, uh, the possibility for the, for the players who's coming to her where she, the, the holes are, uh, the possibility for them to shoot. So if we, oh, sorry, I will go forward here. Yeah. I should not do that. We should go here, sorry. We should be here, mm, there maybe. Here we are with Silvia Navarro. I will not touch it again. Uh, the last one I want to show you is uh, Silvia Solberg, one of my goalkeepers uh, from Norway. And she is uh, also, as you can see, uh, making her way of playing. She's very good physically prepared, uh, of course, and also technically and tactically. But she is playing in a different way of the other goalkeepers. She's trying to make her best out of her possibility. And that's very important that we should look at the goalkeepers in the way that uh, they should be acting or their way of playing. Silvia Navarro, who is a small goalkeeper, she's playing her way. Uh, Ekele is playing her way. Tomasevic is playing her way. Silvia Sorbeg is doing the, the best of her way. So we should never try to uh, oblige a goalkeeper to play a way that they are not comfortable. No? So here we can see the last shots from uh, Silvia Solberg. And uh, then we should all go over to look at some shots from the, from the men's world. Uh, I think this is the last one. And this is what I wanted to say before. This is goalkeeping. How we should do it, stop the ball and then start the attack. This is excellent goalkeeper. And that is what we are saying, the goalkeeper coaches. This is the best way of goalkeeping. When we stop the ball and we start the attack. But what I wanted to show with this small video of uh, five different goalkeepers is that uh, to tell you that it's not one way. We can't make everybody to roses. We have to make them to the, be, do the best of their own for their possibilities. We should now look at five goalkeepers from the, uh, who is playing in the German Bundesliga. 
the Bundesliga is uh, for a lot of play, people in the world uh, the best uh, handball league in the world, and uh, maybe the best players someday wants to play there and uh, de demonstrate that they have been playing in the Bundesliga. No? And I will show you five different styles of goalkeepers here. And uh, after that, we can talk a little bit more about it. The first one is uh, Milosavljevic, Milosavljevic, who is playing in uh, Serbia, and in this way, he's playing in Berlin. And if you look at his style as a goalkeeper, it's not a traditional way. It's a far away from a traditional way of being a goalkeeper. But he is saving and he's very good. In this season, he has the best uh, saving percentage of the uh, German Bundesliga. He is the goalkeeper who has uh, saved uh, most shots of everybody comparing with the shots he's receiving. He's playing in Fuxi Berlin. He's been doing an excellent season. He's young, 24 or 25 years. I don't know exactly now. And he's doing his first season in Bundesliga. And that's very interesting to see. And the people are, are coming in this way. And he's not doing anything in a traditional way. He's doing everything that he is feeling. That is the way how I should act. And the next one we should look at, it's a totally opposite goalkeeper. Niklas Landin, one of the best goalkeepers also in the world. He's playing in Kiel. And I want to try to stop this video in one moment. If you look there, this is one of the way that I think a lot of goalkeepers is trying to um, copy. We have to be aware of that Niklas Landin is two meters tall and he's playing with the arms very high and very out. And that's what he's feeling very comfortable with. But I think when I see a lot of goalkeepers in the world, younger ones, small ones that stay in this position, that Niklas Landen is using as a very good for him. Maybe it's not the best way for everybody to play. That I think we should be very uh, aware of. But Niklas is playing technically, maybe the best technical goalkeeper in the world. And uh, we should look at him. So he's moving around with small movements. He's very tall and it's, uh, have a, a, a big, uh, what I call a wingspan between the arms. And he can, with small movements, reach very long out to the post and make very good saves. So it's an excellent goalkeeper. Uh, but I think there is too many people that it's not aware that he is very tall and uh, it's not appropriate for the small goalkeepers to play the same way. Uh, we can see here in some shots, for example here, then he nearly don't have to move anything because he's so uh, tall and he can almost reach to all the corners of the goal. No? Now we have another uh, Balkan goalkeeper that I call it, uh, Boric, who's playing, he's in Bosnia, he's playing in uh, Flensburg. He's also totally different style. He's coming in in what I call in the, uh, the summer flowers. And he's one of the goalkeepers that is playing also very, very good in the German league. He was number three in the saving percentage of the Bundesliga. And that's uh, what I can say you. He's having the style that is what I call it a little bit more of a, a Western style, Wild West and the old uh, Wild West movies that we see when he's having the arms down like uh, shooters. And he's uh, not also using the traditional way of a goalkeeper, what we expect from a goalkeeper. But what we expect from the goalkeeper is this, to save the ball. That is what the, is the most important thing for the goalkeeper. Here we have one of my goalkeepers that I'm working with, uh, Andreas Palika. As I said to you before, he, uh, in the showing you, he can't be playing in a traditional way, because as you can see in these uh, actions, he is very intensive, he is very powerful, and he is very quick. And he should use that way of playing to benefit when he's playing, not to be obliged to, uh, to play in another way that is not him. And as I said before, I, yeah, we have two more shots on him. Uh, I think this is one of the one more example what I expect from the goalkeepers save the ball and start the attack. This is excellent goalkeeping.
That is what we are looking for all the time. And this is the last one. My other Swedish goalkeeper I'm working with, uh, uh, Mikael Appelgren, totally different from uh, Palika. And as you can see, here's he's what I'm doing, you saying, using this what a kind of uh, boxing style. He's standing in a boxing position with the arms lower, pushing uh, the, the knees flexible, the hips flexible, and he's in a comfortable position for him. He's also very tall. Not as tall as a landing, but he, even if it is tall, he wants to use the power in his legs, the power in his body to reach out to the corner. We will see that in one of the shots now, how he's using the power. Totally different technique, but he likes to work with this, what I call boxing position, with the arms, with the hands under the eyes. So he's looking over the eyes, uh, uh, over the hands, no? Always in movements, always in position to be in the right moment where the ball is getting to be shot. There we can see now, I think here is the one of the key moments of the game. And he is making a save, not the same way as landing, but also efficient. Uh, and uh, we have, I think it's two more shots we would see from him that they're always looking for the ball, always be in the right position. Uh, when the ball is moving around in the attacker, taking it calmly and as always for the goalkeeper, the key moments when it's less seconds left, it's very important to make the last save. So in the, in the goalkeeping, it's not the only to make a lot of saves. We also have to make it in the right moment. So, um, and the right moment always, the last shot, the goalkeeper that have control over the nerves and the mental capacity to make a save in the last shot, like this. We have to score 28, 27 in the, in the last shot. It's very important also, but that we can talk about in another day. So, what I'm talking about also about goalkeeping, before we make a small first break uh, about uh, with questions, if anyone has any questions, is... Um, my way of thinking is that um, we have a way of uh, uh, working or thinking about as goalkeeper trainers, coaches, um, or head coaches, is that we should think about the physical preparation or the physical possibilities of the goalkeepers. Is doing, saying my possibilities for my technique the technical possibilities I have. And the technical possibilities I have is giving my, my tactical possi possibilities. I want to explain this a little bit uh, further on now because the physical way, uh, it's uh, very important for the goalkeeper. And the physical way is not only to be strong, it's, uh, it's not only to be, yes, what I say, uh, powerful. Uh, but a goalkeeper is very important to have motricity, coordination, and also to have flexibility, uh, stability. We have to be uh, have a good um, flexibility in the hips and, uh, and around the, the, the middle of the body. And then we have to be, have also the possibility to be stable in the moment that we need to be stable. So the, the physical preparation of the goalkeeper, also with the motricity, coordination, and everything that we have to do, Especially with, the, especially with the with the young goalkeepers, is very very important. And this is making the decisions for me as a goalkeeper trainer. What kind of techniques this goalkeeper can use? Because if I if I'm not physically well prepared, especially in the in the way of uh, the flexibility, the elasticity, uh, elasticity as a goalkeeper, then it's very important, uh, almost impossible to work in a technical way, the, the way I want the goalkeeper to be. So if I have limits in the physical way of playing, then I will have limits in the technical way of playing. So we should always, uh, in all ways, uh, when we're talking about goalkeepers, start with a physical way. And then we should go on, go further on with the techniques. And when I see what kind of techniques my goalkeeper can use, then I can go on and talk with my uh, goalkeeper about tactical play, the individual and the collective tactical play. So it's a way that we work, physical, technical, tactical. So if, uh, as I said, 
the physical way of preparation is uh, giving me open up or closing down the possibility for the goalkeeper. Because if I, I'm not physically good prepared, I will have a disadvantage in my technique. And if I have disadvantage in my technique, my technical way will not be the, the good way. And as we said in the beginning, the technical way is the most important way if you want to have good goalkeepers. So if I can't reach the top level uh, because I have problems in the physique or the technique, then I won't be the best goalkeeper in the world either tactically. So this is what I also want to say is very, very important. Maybe we should make a small break there and make see if there is any, any questions. Courtney, is there anything to ask me so far? Yes, uh, we have a lot of people interested about shorter goalkeepers in particular, different is the different training approaches and especially about positioning. Um, as you talked about how Ekerlis stands a bit further out. Can you talk a bit about this? Yeah, I will also come on a little bit further on about this, but I, I, I can say directly what I can see a lot of uh, trainers and goalkeepers, small goalkeepers. Uh, for me, there is no one is too small to be a good goalkeeper. We can see it from Silvia Navarro and Eckerle in the women's handball. They are uh, quite small. Uh, I think Silvia Navarro is 167 mm -hmm. and she's a top goalkeeper in the world. But the big problem, uh, and we also have in the men's, uh, Andreas Palika is not a giant uh, like Landing or, or Mikael Appergren. And we have a lot of top goalkeepers also. That is uh, Perez de Vargas, in, uh, who's playing in Barcelona and Spain. He's not either a big, uh, huge goalkeeper. But the problem with a lot of goalkeepers is when they are small, they try to um, compensate that with standing in the wrong way in the goal because they're standing on the toes with the knees uh, uh, straightened and the hips straightened. That means that they try to fool the shooter that they're bigger than they are, but the only thing that they are uh, achieving is a, a complicated situation for themselves to use the power in the body. Because for me, the most important for the goalkeeper when you're small is that you can use the power that you have in the legs. If you, if I, uh, have a goalkeeper that is two meter like uh, Niklas Landin or uh, almost like Appergrind. I don't need the same power in my legs to reach the ball uh, who's coming up in the corners. But if I'm a smaller goalkeeper, I need more power in my legs. So if I go into the gym and I train a lot of power and I go into to the handball court and I stay with uh, uh, up on my toes and I stay with straight knees and hips, then it's no, no effort because I can't use this. Because if I want to use the muscles, the power in my muscles, I must, it must be a little bit more flexible and the knees and the, and the hips and everything to, to, to push myself. When I want to push myself to the right or to the left or, or jump, nobody, if you look at a high jumper, is jumping with the straight legs. Everybody's taking uh, down and put, getting into the power and then straight away. Nobody is standing up there with a straight leg. So I, I think it's very, very important that the, all the coaches are aware of to be a good goalkeeper. If you are small, you need to build up some power, but also use the power, not build the power, then uh, stop it by standing with the, the, the muscles tensed and straight out. I think that is the most important thing. Uh, uh, what can I say? The most the best advice I can give the small goalkeeper mm -hmm. and also the small goalkeepers, like I said about small Silvia Navarro, for me is an excellent example that uh, as you're in a small uh, goalkeeper, you could be aware of what the players are going to shoot. Because if you're uh, giving them uh, the possibility to shoot up, the ball, most of the ball is coming there and you should be prepared tactically that the ball is coming up there. Mm -hmm. Um, one more that some people are asking, I don't know if you're going to address this further, so if you're going to talk about this more, we can skip this, um, but someone asked, if you do have goalkeepers with very different styles, how do you train them in the same team? Yeah, it's uh, like I said before, um, 
the training we are doing, it's uh, even if the men's or women's, we are training uh, in the same way. Uh, for example, if we go to the gym uh, and we have almost the same exercise, even if you're big or you're small, but I, then I make small changes. Uh, what I said, the pre physical preparation is uh, for all the goalkeepers is more similar, even if you're big or, or small, but the, the smaller, maybe we give a little bit more extra to the power in the legs, like I said before. When we're training in the goal, we're, uh, we're in the shooting exercises that we go further on and talking about further on, and uh, when I'm coaching the goalkeeper, I'm coaching them uh, in, in the tactical way of their positions or uh, possibilities. When I'm talking to, to them in the training, during the training, I'm, I'm talking to Appelgren or to uh, Silja Solberg in one way, and I talk to... Uh, Emily Stein Sander or to uh, uh, Andreas Palika in another way. When I can see what they need to develop, I talk about them, about they have to develop. So, but the exercises are more or same the same because the shooting is coming from, to them from every, every, in all the positions like we are doing in the game. But the way that I'm reaching them, what I'm explaining to them, what I try to coaching them, and what we are talking about is different. Uh, what I talked to Palika, Appergren, Sander, or Solberg. Some different things that I've talked to them about, no? Okay, we can continue, I think, uh, to the next block. Uh, I think this one is important to explain a little bit more what I think about uh, goalkeeping and uh, education. Because here we are talking about the development of the go young goalkeepers. I should explain this, uh, uh, this uh, PowerPoint here. Uh, what I can say, down here we have the ages from uh, initiation of the uh, playing handball up to you get the senior player, no? And uh, in here, in the, in the youngest ages, uh, we can see uh, that we had in this blue line is the saving percentage. When we are very young, we have a lot of saves. And this is the, the scoring, the goals, the percentage of scoring that is getting up because of the players, the young players, they are not shooting so hard and they are not shooting so with a good uh, precision. So it's easier for a goalkeeper in these ages when we are starting in the goal to save. And when we're reaching here, somewhere between 13 and 16 years, yeah, yeah, it's different where, where we are in the world. If we are men, we are women. This is what I call the 50%. Here somewhere is the, when the, the shooters are making more, scoring more than the goalkeeper are saving. And when we are reaching that point, we have to be starting a little bit earlier than that with training about the technical preparation. My, my, my thinking, my thoughts of this is when we are starting as a goalkeeper or we are starting playing handball, nobody, uh, nobody or almost nobody don't need to go directly into the goal. First of all, we should learn to be handball players. We can be into the goal, some trainings, and then we could be players on the field and we can changing. And we, then when we are reaching about 10, 11, 12 years old, then maybe we should decide if I want to be a goalkeeper or I want to be a field player. If I enjoy to play in the goal or I enjoy to play in the field. But in these ages, in the youngest age, from 10 to 13 years old, in this part of the development of the goalkeeper, for me, the most important part is the physical preparation and the tactical preparation. And when I'm talking about the physical preparation and this, the 10 to 13 years old, then I'm not talking about power preparation. I'm talking about motricity. I'm talking about coordination, flexibility, elasticity, that the goalkeepers in these younger ages should be prepared for what will be coming on later. Because a lot of goalkeepers, especially uh, men's goalkeepers, when they're coming up to these ages, after 13 years, and they should be taught, start to train about techniques, 
they don't have the possibility to train about these techniques because they are not physically prepared, especially with speciality with uh, elasticity. It's not necessarily with power training here, but motricity, coordination, uh, flexibility, el elasticity, that's very important in these ages. When I talk about tactical preparation, it's what I uh, showed you in the first photo. It's very important that the, the goalkeeper in these ages is shown uh, a little bit about how the shooters are thinking and they should be learning to uh, by themselves, not by us as a coaches, by themselves, try to learn a little bit about the body language of the shooter and where the ball is coming. They should learn to be attacking the ball. The most important for them is to stop the ball. So they should be learning to focus on the shoulder, the body language and the ball, and they should be enjoying just playing. And the last, what we should do be acting in these ages up to 13 years, is the technical preparation. The technical preparation for me in this age should be the ground position, what I was talking about, the boxer position. Make it comfortable for the goalkeeper. Make it easy for the goalkeeper, that the, the, the knees are flexible, the, the hips are flexible, that we are moving around a little bit like a boxer, the Muhammad Ali, that we should be between the ball and the goal, moving around with no problems, no... Uh, no knees that is very straight and no muscle that is tense. Everything should be soft. And when we're getting up here, we a little bit before this 13 to 16 years, before the 50%, then we should be starting over to start to talk more about the technical preparation. Here, we should be able to use, to help the goalkeeper with techniques, different techniques from the dist long distance shots. If it should be sitting on the floor, standing up on the floor, with one hand, with two hands, we should be training the techniques in the in the middle height from the wings with a knee that get in close to the to the body, uh, halfway or with straight leg with a close shooting from the wings and from the pivot players. Here we have a lot of work to do with the techniques. We can uh, we continue with the physical preparation, but maybe we now should put in a little bit more power training. We should be in more power training because we need to reach the ball that is coming far away from the body. And here we have been doing a lot of motricity, coordination, and that we should continue, always continue with that. And here we should start in the other way of tactical preparation. That's what I said, this is red. This is the goalkeeper's own tactical preparation. Here we start with 13, 14 years old and up, all the way up with the tactical preparation of the goalkeeper. How, where should I stand? Where are the holes? How uh, should I attack uh, the geometrics? Uh, what is the best position in this, uh, this moment? Here is where I start to work with the goalkeepers in that way. And when we're reaching 18 years and senior level, then we continue, maybe a little bit less technical preparation. We continue with the physical preparation always, and we have even more tactical preparation because when we're getting a, uh, up here in these ages, they are very complicated uh, after 18 years old to have time and possibility to change the technical way of the, play, the goalkeeper is playing. Here it's more or less more important to continue developing the tactical and the physical preparation. Um, what I want to say is also this part here that is the technical preparation. I will show it further on also. It's very, very important when we start to work with a technical preparation that the goalkeeper is learning the right techniques for his possibilities. Because the worst thing that we can happen is when we're getting senior players and we have a goalkeeper coach that says, oh, oh, this is not a good way of techniques for you to use. We have to change this. And change something that is bad uh, shown uh, uh, educated from the beginning it's more complicated than show something new it's easier to learn something new than to reprogram because if we have to make a new programmation or learn a new or different technique to goalkeeper then it's problem so it's very important that we learn from the beginning right educate technique for this goalkeeper that is good for me
So this is what I show with this uh, post that there were different stages of goalkeeper training. No, the young ones, the middle age, to say it, when you are preparation from 13 to 18, and then from 18 on up. Where should be the most time of the, the preparation in general? No. So, if you look at the four stages of the development of the goalkeeper, we have the first one that is unconscious incompetence. This is the start, four steps in the goal. We copy all the idols. And that is, not, that is normal. That is not only for goalkeepers. Um, the, the goalkeeper in this way is mm, incompetent because just he has never been in the goal. But he starts, goes into the goal, and then starts with the first problem. What they're saying then, it's copying old idols. A lot of uh, these old idols like we have been seeing on the videos, have different styles. And if you copy an idol that is saying, oh, I like the London style, or I like the Appelgren style, or I like the Panica style, you are not aware of that maybe that is not the appropriate style for you. And then we are starting with the problem. We are starting to do something that is not appropriate for me. But this is what's happening. We are having this unconscious incompetence in the beginning. The next step for the goalkeeper is conscious uh, incompetence. We start with techniques, but we can't perform them efficiently. And why can't we perform them efficiently? Because we are not prepared physically. We are trying to do something that we are not able to do. We have not flexibility, or we have not the same uh, enough strength to, uh, to uh, move up a leg or something. We are doing techniques too early when we're not able to do it right. And then we are learning something wrong. So this is the conscious incompetence. The next step is the conscious competence. This is when the goalkeeper knows the techniques and strategies, and it's also uh, uh, executing them. Now they can do it physically, but we can't do it because we, have, uh, we do it thinking. We take a little bit too much time to do it. If you want to do a save, it's not, the, as we said in the beginning, the ball is coming 120 kilometers per hour. In this age, it maybe it's not so hard. But if we have not time to thinking, a, a goalkeeper that is thinking about the techniques, it's too slow. It must be in the last step, the unconscious competence. Techniques and strategies executes automatically. This is the stage where we, are, we try to reach. And that one is what we are working all the way, but all the goalkeepers go through these four stages. Unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then the last one, unconscious competence. All these four stages, all goalkeepers go through. And like I said in the beginning, one of the most dangerous places is this, the conscious incompetence when we start with techniques, but can't perform them efficiently. That is the dangerous part. And then it's where a lot of uh, the goalkeeper trainers want to do things with the goalkeepers too early because they are not ready phys physically. I want to show you two, um, two photos about this, the, the last two stages, the conscious competence uh, is this. If you look at this young uh, goalkeeper, is a Norwegian uh, goalkeeper. Uh, now she's a little bit older, but this photo, she was, uh, she's a good goalkeeper. She was very talented and she is her ages, playing in the national team. And she was uh, in these ages making a lot of saves, but also a lot of thinking. If you look at the uh, position of the arms, we're looking at the eyes, she, you can almost see that she's thinking a little bit how to save the balls, technically. And this is the same as the young guitar player who wants to learn to play the guitar what he's doing he's looking at his fingers he's doing a where to put the hand and he's thinking to play he's learning to play and she's learning to play what is happening when we're getting to the unconscious competence we are getting to Paco de la Fia he unfortunately he has gone away passed away but he look at him when he was playing he was a master He's uh, something incredible in the guitar playing. And when he was playing, he was closing his eyes. He was getting into his mood by himself. And he was not looking at anything. 
techniques and strategies executes as much the same as my goalkeeper Silvia Solberg when she's playing. In this way, when she's making the same, she's looking at the arm, she's looking at, at the everything here, and she makes everything automatically. She's not doing anything thinking here. This is the stage that we should reach as a senior player. There is very important that we can't be thinking when we get reaching these stages of playing. So what I was saying before, the, the important thing in the stages of development, this, the conscious competence, is here. When we started thinking about from 13 years up to 17, 18 years, when we know techniques and strategies, but execute thinking. This is the way where the goalkeeper maybe not always is making the good saves in a smooth way, but here is when we have to accept that the goalkeeper are not making always the best saves because he's working with the techniques to be able, when he's getting up, to be a senior player. So here is where we have the conscious competence, where we should work with the techniques and the strategies, but they are trying to get out of the, the, the thinking way to get into the uh, automatic way, no? Uh, should we make a small stop there and see if there are any uh, questions right now? Um, I'm not sure there's many related to this, but um, maybe one thing that's a bit interesting is someone is asking about when you start to teach cooperation with the defense. I don't know if you're going to cover this later. Yeah, I can start. Why? The cooperation with the defense to learn that I think uh, if I should go back here also in this case of here around uh, 14 15 years old because here we start to work with the techniques and then we work also the tactical way no like I said before we have the technical we had uh, we have the physical preparation and we have the tactical preparation no so when we're getting into this part of the education of the goalkeeping, about 14, 15 years, then it could start to work about the collaboration between the defense and the goalkeeper, because this go related between the technique and the tactique, no? So uh, my, my point of view is always what we should learn the goalkeeper from the beginning is, we have choose the position um, to be the last one. Like I said in the beginning, uh, in the game when we are playing, it's it's uh, ah I don't I don't know uh, to say it uh, in the proper way, but the best position in a, in a handball uh, team is the goalkeeper position. Uh, we are uh, a team player, but we are playing in an individual way, no. And what is happening that we are the last one in the team. We are there when the team has made some mistakes or we have uh, they are shooting at us we have the possibility to make the save, no? So we have always to be aware of that when we are talking about the tactical training. The goalkeeper should be aware of that your position is there to sometimes you should collaborate with the, the defense, but sometimes the defense make these mistakes and your position is there to, to help the defense, to save the ball, even if there has been mistakes, no? But the collaboration between goalkeeper and defense should start also here, around 15, 16 years old. Not earlier, and of course not the later either. And someone also asked about training the goalkeepers to, to be calm. And I think this is interesting to consider in this unconscious competence that's almost part of it. Um, what, what is that? Is that just related to confidence in their own technique and tactics? Oh, here we, now we can uh, talk for a couple of days. <laughs> now we're talking about the experts. No, uh, no, this is a lot. This is uh, the mental part is one of the things that I like a lot to talk about. And I like to, uh, I work a lot with that also. I'm not a psychologist in uh, no way, but I read a lot about it. And uh, I try to work with my goalkeepers in, in some way. But uh, to find this, what we call it, flow, when you're a senior player to play, just play. One of the things that we should be uh, aware of, what we can learn them from the beginning, is like what I'm talking about. Be uh, calm in your own physical way in the body. 
because what I was talking about, if you are doing something uh, that you don't feel comfortable with physically, then your brain is not comfortable either because you are thinking about the position of your arms, you are thinking about the position of your uh, elbows, you are thinking about the position of your knees, you're, you're thinking about things that you shouldn't be thinking about. No, that, that should be automatically. The, 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 the body language should not interpret it in the, the brain. And that is one of the main part because uh, then we have a lot of uh, things to be confident. The confidence is uh, very important for the goalkeeper. The mental part of the confidence is very important for the goalkeeper. And this, uh, I can say, it, it's so much to talk about this. So in today, we can't go further on with that. But what I can say in this presentation today, it's important that we can then take away the body, uh, the messages from your body should not interrupt your brain. Because the brain should just be thinking about the opposite and it should be thinking about the shooter and the, your own defender, no? It should not be, be aware of not techniques, not be uh, thinking about, oh, uh, now I should do this. And we should absolutely not be thinking about consequences. That is one of the biggest problems for the goalkeeper. We are thinking about the consequences. But what I said, this will be another presentation another day, not this summer maybe, but uh, it will be coming uh, probably on the, on the academy in the, in the future. Excellent. Uh, I think <laughs> then we can move on if you're ready. Okay. We go on. So the next step, uh, step is the saving methodology. I think we have to speed up a little bit. We have two parts left. So the the saving methodology we have uh, two ways. Uh, two uh, uh, two ways. No, we have to start with uh, before the game. We start with analyze. Um, that's different in the world because here in Europe uh, it's normal that everything is done with videos, we have information, but it's not only the information that you have on videos. You can also have information that you're talking with someone. You can also have information about the opposite, uh, what you're going to play against, but also I'm talking about handball knowledge, uh, normal handball knowledge. Uh, a goalkeeper should not only be a goalkeeper, it should know about handball. We have to pass the ball, we have to move outside, be a, know to be a, a field player, know about handball knowledge. So we start to analyze before the game, thinking about, I'm going to play a game tomorrow or this afternoon, what will happen? Who is coming? Where is he shooting? Where is she shooting? How are they playing? What are they doing? What will happen today? That is what we start with. The next way uh, we have to do it during the game, when we started the game, we have to read the game. We have to read the defense and the attack. And from that, I can use goalkeeper strategies. Uh, I know what, how we should defend because I'm inside the game. I'm inside, I'm talking to my coach. Uh, we know if we should play 6-0, 5-1, 3-2-1, 4-2. What kind of defense should we use? How is my defenders collaborating with me? I know that. That's what we are training every day, no? But I have to also read my defense. What are they doing in this moment? And we have to read the, the game. What is really happening? That is what's the difference between a good goalkeeper and maybe not a good goalkeeper because they stay with the knowledge, but they're not reading the game. What the Stervik and the, the experts and the, of the handball, they are reading the game. They're reading the situation. Where is the possibility to, uh, to, uh, to finish the game so I can win some time in position? Okay? So here we can talk about the goalkeeper strategies. The next step is to read the shot. Now we have come to the situation that uh, the players, the opposite, the attackers, are uh, uh, con making a construction of the attack and they are putting one player into the posi position with the ball in a good position for them to shoot. And then we have, as a goalkeeper, to read the shot. We have, used, uh, we have to use different goalkeeper techniques. Now we are getting from the strategy, because now we're inside the situation. Here will be a shot. I am going from positioning to action. Before, I had to make my, my movements when they're attacking, uh, the attackers are, uh, are come under construction of the game. And then I go into my position, doing the reading the game. 
and now I'm really prepared for the shot. Now I'm going to act. And now I have uh, automatically uh, decided what kind of technique I should use. Because if I'm thinking about what technique I should use, I'm too late. I have to be automatically making my techniques. And I should be concentrating on the body language of the shooter. I should try to read the shot. And the last week, uh, part when I'm doing this is I should be focused on the arm and the ball. Focus on the arm and the ball because I've been reading the shot and this is what's happening with the goalkeeper. We are having going from a, a wide screen when the, we had this, the, the attacker is starting. We have a wide screen uh, opening eyes. We see from, from wing to wing. But in this moment, when we're coming to the last moment of the shooting, it is like this. What's happening here? This is the position. So my goalkeeper, Katrina Lunde, she is in this moment very, very focused on this player. She don't see anything more than this arm, this shoulder, this head, this shoulder, this elbow, this ball. She's concentrated on that. If I ask her, if she can see this player, she don't see this player, her own player, Arntzen. She's playing with, his, uh, with the, uh, Katrine Lunde. She don't know that she's, she's not aware of that this player is here. She's just aware of this because she's focused on the arm on the ball. So she's coming from a wide screen to a very focused, and this is the moment of the save. So this is the way that we have prepared the methodology of, uh, of saving. No? So, we go into the last part of the presentation for the last uh, 15 minutes, and we should go to the uh, methodology of the goalkeeper training. And there is, uh, for what I call it, the simple technique training. And that is uh, one of the problems. A lot of time we dedicate too much training on this way. This is 100 controlled shots and the visible shooters and shots. I will demonstrate here this kind of training where the players are coming, well, here we can make a, a, a training situation. The players are passing to the center, a passing ball, and we are making a penetration, a breakthrough between two uh, players. And we should shoot on one position of the game. We are training technique, simple technique training. The 100% uh, controlled shot, and the goalkeeper see the ball, the visible shooters and shots. And that is what we're doing a lot. And sometimes we're doing too much. Uh, and every training, a lot of times, we are doing this too much. We are shooting up left and right, left and right, left and right, down, left and right, left and right. That is, and then the goalkeeper is doing it automatically, but they are not ready. They are not there uh, mentally. They are not there mentally. They are not, uh, not training the technique. They are not doing anything. But this is when I want to train sometimes, simple technique training. It's important when we're doing it Good, but when you're coming, you're coming up to senior level, maybe you're doing it too much. But as in, in this uh, junior stages, the, the younger ages, it's in very important to have this kind of training, the simple technique training, to learn the techniques, no? But not only from the long distance, also from uh, breakthroughs or from wing positions. The next level is what I call the cognitive technique training. This is a way that I use a lot, uh, where shooters have options, and we are talking about hidden shots. For example, here we have uh, not, def not living defenders. Uh, we have uh, hidden shots. We can put carpets, we can to put dolls, uh, we can shoot players that is uh, passive players. But here the goalkeeper, they are not aware exactly where the ball is coming. But for example, if they're shooting on one side, the ball should be coming on the same side of the goal. So the goalkeeper has to make movements and the shoot is coming. It's cognitive technique training. It should still be aware of the, uh, the technique, but it's not only coming on one place. We can, uh, they have options. For example, in this middle exercise, the wing player have three options. If you're taking the small angle, then they should shoot free. If they're shooting from the middle angle, I can tell them they should shoot around the hips. And if they're taking the big angle, maybe I tell them to shoot in the long corner. So the goalkeeper here should cognitively look at the shooter. Where is he jumping from? 
she's jumping from the, the from the small. Okay, it's a free shot. I should be play uh, the position, and I should stay calm. It's coming from the middle position, and I should be uh, aware of. I should train my technique on one of my hips, but I don't know if it's coming to the right or to the left. I have to read the body language of the shooter if it's coming to the right or the left, and then I should work with the technique. So this is a cognitive technique training. I have to use my brain first, and then I should use my technique also. So this is a one way of training that I like a lot, the cognitive technique training. I also use the simple technique training when I need to do a, a, a movement for my goalkeeper, yes. But I prefer this cognitive technique training. The next step in the methodology of the training, or the goalkeeper training, is reading the shot. And then we are talking about the body language of the shooter. And we have situation with shoes. Shoot or pass, for example, all small game situations. Uh, what is happening here is we are playing, for example, we're putting in a defender. We can make, in this exercise to the left, we have first a small shot from the wing that is just to, to make two shots. So make, like I said before, they can make from the small angle, middle angle, or big angle. And then we have a second shot, and the player is coming from, uh, from the uh, left back, getting into the middle position, and the defender, the green one here, has to make a movement and come in and help me. So here, I can also have a pivot player, but here I should try, try to read the situation. If the, the defender is coming in time to help me, and uh, where is he helping me? Reading the shot, if he's helping me or he's not helping me, he's helping me to the right, to the left of the goal, the goal. Is he helping me so much so the ball is passed to the pivot? Then I should be prepared to act, to go to the pivot player. So this is reading the shot, no? The body language of the shooter, situation we choose, uh, shot or pass, for example. And we have another small game situations, two against two, three against three. Here we have a small situations. There we have two back players and one pivot player. So these players in the back players, they can pass the ball between them. They can shoot or they can pass to the pivot or they can make a breakthrough. So here I have to work with my two defenders and I make this a lot of times with uh, uh, that the, the attackers should be in uh, one player more because I need, want to have a lot of shoots, shots. I want to have a lot of shots on the goalkeeper. So it should be situations where it will be situation with a lot of shots. So this is uh, what I call small way of training, uh, small game situation, but very, very important for the goalkeeper. And here is my job as a goalkeeper coach to be talking to the goalkeepers. How did you see that? Why did you go further on? Why did you wait so long? Didn't you see that the ball was coming into the pivot? And so on and so on. So this uh, is reading the shot training. And the last part of the methodology of the goalkeeper training is what I call reading the game. That is situation du during the game, that we are playing in the game, six against six, six against five, five against six, uh, other situation, but we are a lot of players into the game. We are reading the game and the situations during the game, that uh, when we are playing a game, that I, after that, make an analyze of the game and I talk to the goalkeeper, and we have uh, reading the game and situations during the game. So this is very important for the development of the goalkeeper, especially when we're talking about the senior and we're talking about the tactical. Here is my job, my, uh, my big job right now when I'm working at the top level with my senior goalkeepers is to talk about reading the game. Here we can win a lot of uh, games if we can help the goalkeeper to reading the game, reading the situation during the game, what kind of goalkeeper tactics should we use? Should I go attack him? Should I stay? Should I go left? Should I uh, make a space for them to shoot to the left? Should I make a space for them to shoot to the right? Where, where should the defenders help me? Should they, they help me to the right? Should they help me to the left? So this is one of the most important part when we're getting up to the sem uh, senior levels, no? So here is a resume about what is methodology of the goalkeeper trainer. Simple technique training, uh, when you want to train, it's a, a technique. 
and we should be aware of the, te the technique and the, and the goalkeeper is thinking in this moment because it should be learning a new technique or should develop a good technique. It should be a little bit thinking there. We should make it from, um, uh, from conscience, the unconscious competence. So it should be out automatic, uh, automatically, no? The next way is the cognitive technique training that I say I use a lot, that the goalkeeper should not only make the technique, they should also read the situation, what will happen. And then we have the reading the shot, that we should be learning to read the body language with small game situation, and then reading the game, the situations during the game. And the, all this training should be the mixing during uh, one week or the micro cycle or even during the same training. I can, during the same training, use cognitive technique training, reading the shot, and reading the game. These three parts is always, almost always, uh, in always, almost always in my training. I can use simple or cognitive technique training, and then we go further on to reading the shot training, and then we go to reading the game training. In almost all training we are doing with the goalkeepers, we are working in this way. Sometimes people ask me about material, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, the cognitive or the, uh, the motricity and we are talking about uh, coordination. I use a lot of material, for example, in the ACAS and this hand plat we put on the, on the hands of the goalkeeper for the eye-hand coordinations. We use also these uh, air bodies. So this is material. I think it's very important that we can find things that it's good for the goalkeepers to use, to develop. And this is excellent uh, material that I'm using. And I have put up uh, a way where if anyone wants to um, uh, send a mail to ma one sports order, gmail.com is one the place where I buy them. No? So this is the person that uh, it's a person that is selling them and uh, where you can find out material in this uh, coordination way. No? So, this was the stop. So now we have three minutes over from my time, and I hope that we have some questions. And maybe we'll make five or six, seven minutes extra for that. So thank you so much for my my point of view on this side of the computer. And I hope there's anyone still there, and you have enjoyed this uh, this uh, uh, yeah uh, talking. So thank you so much. And I hope there is some questions now. Yes, uh, there are a lot of positive comments, first of all. So I think a lot of people have found this very informative. Um, one question that's interesting is when doing kind of general video analysis to learn, should goalkeepers be looking at other goalkeepers of their own kind of style or is it best to study shooters? Um, good question. I think it's very important um, that you as a goalkeeper, when you decide to be a goalkeeper, that you talk, that the goalkeeper talk with someone that can help you uh, to see what kind of goalkeeper, what kind of goalkeeper style do you want to have? What kind of goalkeeper style do you want to, uh, to use? And from that, try to find a goalkeeper in the world that is most appropriate to your future style. And then, then you can start to study a little bit of this goalkeeper, no? Work a little bit on that goalkeeper, what he's doing, uh, what techniques does he use? A lot of times, like I said in the beginning, if you're 170, you can't be looking at the goalkeeper at two meters. Or if you're two meters, you can't be looking at the goalkeeper at 170. And that is very important that you find your, your, what kind of goalkeeper do I want to be? Then it's also, of course, a lot of times important try to learn about the, the, the shooters and observe them uh, from different positions, back players to learn that the black, black player when he's coming in certain positions, they are coming to shoot on the long, uh, second post or they're shooting on the first post. And that's why a lot of goalkeepers are very good when they're getting up in ages because that's what we call the experience, no? So if we can take the experience to take it down to the edges by looking at the shooters also. So, I, but I think the first thing I have to decide as a goalkeeper, 
is if I want to look at videos, is to find the goalkeeper that I want to be like. And then after that, start to study the shooters, where uh, back players who's coming from the from inside into the middle, where is normally shooting. In the body language, if it's uh, turning to the left, where is the ball normally coming? No? But uh, I think it's both of them are very important things to study as a goalkeeper. Um, just related to finding out what kind of goalkeeper you are, from a coaching side, how can coaches help their players to find this? And someone also asked about enhancing the goalkeeper's own creativity. How, how can coaches really help their players find their style? Yeah, uh, I think one of the first, thing, first things you can do is to look to the fathers of the player. No? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a small joke, but there you can see the genetics. No? You can see the possibilities. Uh, like I said, uh, I, I remember the first time I saw Palika playing in, in a junior uh, national team and so on. I was seeing him jumping around. He was uh, with a, full of power in that moment. No? And then you can see what kind of goalkeeper uh, style this he is able to be, you know. So I think it's important. First of all, look at the physical possibilities, uh, advantages and disadvantages. It, it, nobody. Will, the first of all, we, we we should think nobody has disadvantage. We should use everything as an advantage, and and uh, we should think what I say a little bit. We can make uh, even tests. You can see uh, at the goalkeeper if they have a lot of flexibility and in, in the hips and so on. Then you can think about okay, you can use techniques. Uh, I should make an example. Matthias Andersson, a Swedish former goalkeeper, now is go working as a goalkeeper coach also. He he had an excellent flexibility uh, in the hips, and he was uh, he had made a lot of saves with a technique with a straight leg and up in a long corner, because he was very quick. And the, the, the shooter didn't expect that from him, that he was able to make the foot up in the long corner in that, in that speed, no? But he discovered that very early, that he had this flexibility in his body, and he developed that from the early years. I was playing with him when he was very young, and I know that he was aware of this possibility, and he was working on that technique from, from early years, no? So it's a little bit... Um, uh, uh, to find out what are your physical possibilities and also the mental possibility. What kind of goalkeeper do I want to be? Am I an aggressive type that I want to attack the ball? Or is I a little bit of more calm uh, person that I want to stay to wait for the ball? So it's also, it's not only the physical, it's also the mental part what we were talking about. What kind of character do I have? I mean, I, is, if I am an attacking goalkeeper, I can't stand to be a goalkeeper that should be standing, waiting for the ball, then I should use this creativity that we are talking about. I should go for the ball. I have to learn that. The, it's, it's, a, it's a part that the mental and the body should be uh, fit together, no? And the creativity of the goalkeeper, I think it's very important what we are talking about is the coordination and motricity in the younger ages. Because the better we can uh, have the, the coordination and the motricity as working, more creati creativity we can use as a goalkeeper when we can uh, be uh, able to use my own body in a creativity, creative way, like Palik is doing. He can jump, and he can stay in the air, and he can change his movement in the air. That's a creativity way, because he has this power, and he has that way. And we have all other goalkeepers that maybe they don't have the power, but they are very uh, stable, and they can go out, lift, starting or lifting up the right leg, and then changing for the left leg. And that's creativity to also, but they have the physical possibility to do it. And they have a, a knowledge about their own body, what they are able to do. Okay, uh, if it's okay, we'll just have one more. Yeah, uh, yeah, for me, it's okay. For me, it's fine. Uh, sorry to everyone that we won't be able to answer all questions, but we are noting everything. And so we hope to address any holes uh, later. Uh, but I think this is interesting. Someone asked about a specific goalkeeper for seven meter penalties. And a lot of what you've talked about has been positional, in, for positional attack and so on. Um, how, how do coaches adjust for maybe training for penalties? And is it good to have a specific goalkeeper who faces all the penalties? 
Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 speech today was about the basic concepts in a different way, no? So that's why I didn't talk about the seven meters on a specific point, no? But okay, generally we can say that the uh, the the situation of the seven meter throws are uh, they are it's it's there are different way to approach it, no? Um, you can approach uh, as a goalkeeper uh, trying to find out by what I said, they analyze before the game. Uh, all the goalkeepers on top level study the opponent. No? They know more or less where the ball is coming, uh, how they study the body language of the shooter, the same way of, uh, of a wing player. If the body is going to the left or the right, the hand is going up and going down. We try to find these clues and they analyze before the game. And we try to find out by this and to see if the it could be that simple. Even if I'm a right-hander, what I'm doing with my left hand can tell me as a goalkeeper where the ball is coming to be. So that is one way of study. Uh, the other way you can do as a goalkeeper, that is to, to try to cheat, try to fool the player. No, You can uh, make a small movement. You can make a, a different position in the goal. You can do uh, different ways that you can try to cheat the shooter, no? But uh, what you should always be aware of, of, of a goalkeeper is what I say, what I think is we have uh, what we can call it a point of no return for the, for the shooter. Uh, now we are also a little bit high level. We're talking about the mental part, but there are a way that we can call it the point of no return for the shooter. But he still has the ball in his hand because the shooter, when he's making the movement and he's going to shoot a seven meter throw in this way, uh, he decision, the decision is made and the ball is uh, uh, still in his hand. And even if I, I move it and I, I make him a move as a goalkeeper and I am n n making uh, a movement that the, the, the shooter sees that I will make the save, but he is not able to stop his movement in that moment because the brain has said, go on. So in that moment, the, the, stop, uh, the point of no return for the, uh, for the shooter is important for the goalkeeper to know because that is the timing where I as a goalkeeper can make my movement. If I do it too early, the, the shooter see it and he will put the ball in the other way. If I do it too late, the ball is going past me through because I was not executing my movement too uh, quick enough. But I have to find out the, this moment of the, the shooter, uh, of the seven meter shooter, the point of no return, then I can do my movement. This is a little bit mm, high level today when we're talking about the basic concept, but it's, it could be interesting to talk about another day. Yes, it's clear there's a, a lot of information to be shared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope it's not been too complicated in some ways uh, sometimes when we're talking about this. I think everyone has loved it. It's very positive feedback so far. Uh, so I think we'll stop there. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you very much to all our participants today. Uh, don't forget to join us next week. We also have two lectures on Friday and two lectures on Saturday. Next week, the two refereeing topics are, are focused mainly on passive play situations, and the coaching is mainly about tactics of specifically for defense um, and including uh, coaching flexible defensive strategies. So that's next Friday. Don't forget that this lecture is available on the IHF Education Center, has been recorded, and that's all from us for today. Thank you very much. Yes, I say the same. Thank you very much for everybody who's been uh, listening and uh, hope to see you soon out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.